Hello everyone. If you are settled down, then we can start the second session of. Uh, everyone, can the people hear us? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> no, so we are starting the second session of LB Java tutorial. Uh, first, I give uh, the outline of this session. So, in the first part, we like to uh, ba uh, be back to the Twitter example. I hope you, some of you at least, could try the example and see how it works. If not, uh, Christos will go through this example and you will have the chance to try it. Um, and meanwhile, you will um, have the room also to set up things if you had problems or you couldn't uh, run Java or whatever, the scripts, then you can ask us questions and we can help you to set it up. Meanwhile, uh, we go uh, via the demo of on the Twitter example. Then we are going to talk about more advanced components of LV Java. Uh, this includes parameter tuning and constraints and global inference. And then at the end of this session, you're going to try a new task, which is uh, classifying movie counts, uh, getting the movie count, uh, and predicting which movie it's related to. So we expect you to get things set up uh, during the first of the uh, part of the session. And then uh, hopefully we'll be able to really make an actual practice at the end of this session using this movie example, which is quite simple and you can uh, really install it. Uh, you can really run it if only you have <coughs> Java. Um, so that's uh, about the outline of the course. Now um, I just uh, briefly give you an overview of the Twitter example, and then we will see the demo. So if you remember from the last session, we had these uh, Twitter um, posts, and then we wanted to classify them as happy tweet or unhappy tweet. And then we said, okay, maybe we want to make um, higher level analysis based on this, the decision of these classifiers. And then the point was that now we are using this learning-based Java, and we learned that we can write a learning model simply with two lines of code to learn a function here. And then we said, now you use your learning-based program, the learner that you declare there, and then make decisions about the future tweets. So this was the whole story about the Twitter example. Um, so we are tr now, um, you can start trying it, and you will see a demo of what the, you, you saw the content of the exercise, I think, the full content of the program and everything was already on the website. Uh, but now you can just see it if you couldn't uh, run it yourself. Thanks. Uh, before I start, can I see a show of hands how many people actually tried it? <laughs> Okay, that's, that's what we hope. Okay, two. Okay. So, for those of you, can I see a so, show of hands why you didn't try it? Was it because Twitter was nasty to you? Uh, register with Twitter, you mean? Okay, okay, that's fair enough. That's a fair criticism. Um, did you try the classification part only? Of, like, did you see the zip file and it had a classifier component? Like the Maven LB Java show of hands. Okay, yeah, almost none. Okay. Anyway, so this is why we're going to do this now, step by step, live. And as far as the Twitter, as I said yeah, the other time, as far as Twitter is concerned, this is you know this is beyond our control. Um, yeah, we, we can't really do anything about it. Maybe can we can we ask another question that uh, if someone uh, ever had the chance to try other examples that we had. Right, yes. Yeah, a few examples. So and so. Okay. Um, that's okay. So um, I'm going to show you the, the, the conceptual overview of before I show you the actual classifier of the, uh, the example that I wanted to, um, for you to run, which is that there is some way for me to get a stream, a live stream of tweets from Twitter itself. Uh, filtered either by location or search terms. And after I have this feed, um, which is stored uh, inside a, 
it's called a blocking queue, but it's like it's a, it's a data structure. I can pull individual tweets and classify them based on the text. So my, my very thin client for Twitter is, um, is, uh, has a single classifier as part of its definition. So as you can see here, which happens to be a pre-trained classifier that I've built for the Twitter with Twitter data. And I will show you how I do that after I show you the, uh, the application. Uh, so what it really does is it says, OK, I know that each tweet comes in the form of a JSON package. And if you don't know what JSON is, it's just basically like a structured text that uh, machines uh, can read easily uh, and, and sort of parse and give you different fields and different um, entries. Um, out of all of that, basically, I just want the text of the tweet. Here, this is, I, I've made this convenience function. It just scans the entire package, which contains, you know, whether it, the tweet contains pictures, whether it has hashtags in it, whether uh, uh, it has any mentions of other users, the location. Um, uh, was that a question? No, OK. Um, and uh, I just want to pull, pull the text for now and say, OK, now with that text, let's make a discrete value. So remember that the classifier returns a discrete value back. So I want a discrete classification value based on, uh, on the text of the tweet. OK? It is as simple as that. So before I show you the actual application running, uh, I want to show you the, uh, the classifier. So if you remember, the structure of the classifier is we start with feature definitions, then we say what the label is that we're trying to learn, and then we say, OK, now how do we go about it, the body of the classifier? So this one, just like the, um, the spam uh, example that I did last time, only looks at unigrams and bigrams. So basically, single words as, as what I call bag of words, just like all the words in, you know, uh, in a single bag with no structure. And then bigrams, which is just pairs of words uh, that come from it. Again, all of them at once. Um, uh, again, if you remember, this discrete um, percentage means that this particular feature extractor returns a list of this type of uh, feature, which is a discrete value of string, right? And this is why we use sense here instead of return, as you would in Java. Um, and my label here is a binary classification, and I say it's either a positive or a negative, right? I operate on a structure called tweet, which I had to write, because a, a tweet can contain multiple fields, can contain its label, can contain its text, can contain its user, uh, date or time when it was created, all of these things. But I only want to get the, la the label for my label, the sentiment label. OK, and now the sentiment classifier itself simply says I want to learn a label. I want to use both my unigram, my word features, and my bigram features. I want to read my input data from this reader, which I also had to write, which I will show you. I want to do five rounds of uh, sparse network learner is one of the possible classifier options. Uh, if you get a chance, you can try individual um, classifiers to see how they respond. And I want to test from uh, uh, another test set that I, that I have in my data, and I, you know, every 10,000 tweets tell me how you're doing, give me a progress report, right? So the main difference in um, running, okay, so before I, I talk about this, here's what a tweet contains. Right now it just contains its label and its text, right? This is the data structure, but you can think of this as a placeholder and you can add all the information that Twitter can give you, and you can use that information as features. So you can say, you know, does this tweet have an image? Does this tweet mention someone? Uh, you know, the at someone. Does this tweet have hashtags? You know, all of these things. Uh, or how many times has this tweet been retweeted? Like, all of this information is available from, from Twitter. So you, you can get all of that. So maybe, you know, a tweet that is being tweet, uh, retweeted, you know, a thousand times maybe is more positive than a negative, because people might not like negative tweets. Who knows? Um, so the reader is, again, very simple. It just takes in a data, uh, a data file, and we assume there is a single line per tweet that contains the, 
the label of the tweet, whether it's positive or not, uh, the text, the user who sent it, and the date it was created. But we're only interested in the text and the label. Um, so this is how we, um, we create a new tweet. So we say it has six different fields, zero to five, but we only care about you know, the, the two fields, the sentiment uh, and the text. OK? Um, the main departure of this example re relative to um, the examples that we did last time is that this one is using Maven, which is a, a build tool for Java, just like Ant, if you're familiar with, or Gradle, for you, those more adventurous types. Um, and it makes it easier to run the LBJava commands and the compile commands that I showed you last time. So all I need to do for this example is call a Maven command that is LBJava. Nice call. In and then LBJava. You can see as previous time it generates the code and it does the compilation, it does the training. It will read 50,000 tweets, that's uh, my training set, and it will give me an accuracy of. Uh, it is gone. It is gone, <laughs> but yes. It will give me an accuracy of 74%, 74.3. Right? So uh, there are multiple factors that can contribute to the accuracy, and we will talk about some of them uh, during the advanced Delta Java. Uh, the size of the training set is one, so I've only used 50,000 tweets to train this. Uh, the original data set from Stanford, uh, if you follow the link, has 1.6 million tweets. Uh, the, only, <laughs> the main reason I'm using 50,000 is because my computer can't handle all of that, <laughs> store it in memory, but there's a more efficient way of doing it. Um, then there is the choice of the classifier. So I chose to use a sparse, sparse network learner, but I could have used any of these other ones here. Uh, and then there's a choice of parameters inside that learner, which we will talk about later in uh, the advanced uh, LBJava section. OK, so now I have my learned classifier, right? So this does not involve Twitter yet. This is all pre-stored data. Someone else classified them for me. A human sat down and said, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive. Uh, and this is all offline. You know, no, no Twitter client is involved. Now we can involve the real stream of data and use our classifier just as a simple Java class, like just like anything else. And this is where I think the fun is. So if we run the Java classifier example, what it will hopefully do is it will con connect. There we go. So it tries to establish a connection with Twitter. And hopefully, there we go, we'll see a live stream of tweets. Yeah, I can't, I, I'm not controlling this. This is all Twitter live. If you tweet something at me right now, we'll probably get it. Uh, please don't. Uh, it will be embarrassing. Um, so yeah, this is all like coming in live. And you can imagine someone harvesting this information as it comes along and says, OK, what can I see? I can see the place. I can see the time. I can see the user. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Again, no censoring. Someone can build a a censorship classifier on top of this and say, oh, you know, I shouldn't show this tweet. This is, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is why I told you you should try it. You, you did not believe me, did you? OK. I should probably stop now. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was actually negative, but uh, yeah. We could filter the negative ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should probably, yeah, not. Um, well, you know. It's a matter of debate, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> that was the whole point, is you can have fun with real data, real world data, and you can use your classifier, and it doesn't have to be a boring machine learning class exercise. That's all I have to say about this. Um, if you do want to try this now, um, at the end of this course, as, as Parisa said, we will do a, a movie quote, so a simpler version of this problem. Um, we would ask you to group together in like groups of two or three um, to, to you know, pair your computational skills and you know, uh, other types of knowledge that you might have. Um, if you want to try the Twitter example while we do that, feel free, go ahead. It, does, it is a bit of a hassle, I, I understand, to register. But um, 
our TAs will be, you know, sort of running around helping you if you need to. Um, us too, probably as well. Um, yes. Any questions? No. Okay. So I think that's about all I had to say for Twitter. Please try it at home. It's fun. You know, see see if you can have anything. You know, any better decisions or any better results. Um, but for now, I'm going to switch back to Parisa to talk about advanced machine learning. So now we are going to uh, discuss some of the advanced components of learning-based Java. It is just to show you what kind of possibilities this software has. But uh, I think it has even more interesting things if you really uh, put hands on it. So uh, one, uh, one possibility is the parameter tuning. Uh, actually, it is, I mean, uh, for many real-world applications, uh, even when you start with a really complex machine learning methodology, very beautiful algorithm, when you are going to apply it on real data, the story is different. You will be surprised that maybe your first try uh, gives you very poor results. That is why you always need to start and uh, do trial and, trial and error with your data and uh, fit your model somehow, improve it, and uh, get a reasonable model that is working on your data. And when you switch your domain, you, you're always surprised at how uh, can be different. And also, the other thing is that uh, for different kind of learning models, um, I mean, if you switch your learning model, maybe um, you, um, I mean, you don't know from, from the beginning that which model works best. And then that's why probably you need to start with something and then start uh, tuning it on your data. That is what we call parameter tuning. And uh, so you have always free parameters to set for any kind of technique that you're going to use. And sometimes you're going to use your uh, background knowledge on the domain, on the problem. And uh, see, for example, uh, see you, you recognize that, OK, I. I don't want to get very precise, fit uh, very precisely the model on my data because I know this data is very noisy, so I just want to get something. That's why I tune the parameters in this way that the error on the data shouldn't be really very low. Some, for example, if I get some error based on my data above, uh, uh, below like 3%, 5%, I'm still OK. Uh, so these are your uh, instincts and your background knowledge about the domain that can help you. Uh, the other thing is that, for example, for this course, we don't have time to uh, really spend uh, like 1,000 times of rounds of training, or even maybe for some, uh, some models, you, you can do like online and batch. Maybe your memory doesn't allow you to do a batch setting, and you want to do everything online, one by one. So you are setting these uh, parameters based on your computational and memory capacities. And one standard uh, uh, way of tuning your model is that when you don't have any idea, really, how to set your parameters, is that you uh, set aside a subset of your data which is labeled, which is annotated. You know the predictions about it. And then you call it development set. Now you start trying to fit your parameters, find the best parameters based on your development set. So this is actually very uh, tedious work to do manually. So this is the possibility that learning-based Java will give you to uh, set your parameters on your development set automatically. And uh, you should be aware that uh, fitting your model on your test data is cheating. So you should really, uh, when you want to report the, uh, the accuracy, the performance of your model, you should really report it on some uh, really blind, unobserved data you have, you have never tried. So because we want to, for example, to, uh, use the training for training and then test it on some. You can do cross-validation, right? In the cross-validation, if you know it, if you are asking this question and you, are, you mean that. So, uh, so you have your training data, right? And your model, you don't know which threshold, what number of uh, rounds 
you should run this algorithm. What, uh, for example, which uh, you want to minimize error on the training, but you don't want, you will never get like 100 percent maybe for some approaches uh, accuracy even on the training. But you are okay with something below one percent, right? Or you say I I am okay w with something below. Um, one per thousand errors, right? So these are the parameters that you need to tune. And then you have the training to train from, and you want to check, now I set these parameters, how it works on the data. And you, you use the development set, right? You check with uh, below one percent and say, okay, on development set, now I get 90 percent accuracy. And you, you lower your error uh, parameter, and then you get like 95 percent accuracy. And now you choose your best model. But if you do this on the test, it means you are cheating. You, because when uh, you train your model based on some uh, development set, you assume that you've picked your model, and hopefully this works in future unobserved data. But for reporting the accuracy of your model to other people that know how your model works, you cannot really report the tuned, fitted model on the development set, so you tried it on the test set. So that is the expected accuracy that you can report or claim for your model. That is the whole idea of the parameter tuning. Does that make sense? OK, so uh, actually there is a story behind it. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a very recent story uh, which relates to, to your question, which is there are real world consequences for doing this overfitting and overtuning of your test set, which is I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Baidu. I assume most of you will have heard of it. Yes? OK. So there is a very famous competition among vision researchers, computer vision researchers, which is recognizing objects from images. Right? So I give you an image, and you tell me, does this contain you know, a dog, a cat, a car, you know, all of these things. Right? So this competition, this image net, is run every year. And, and Baidu, this, this, this past year, submitted a system that actually what they did was they keep pinging the servers with requests to, te to test the data. And what they were doing is they were getting a result, sending another system back, getting a result, sending another system back, which was supposed to be you know, blind data, was not supposed to be you know, looked at ever, but only once at the very end of the stage. So this is not, I mean, it's confirmed partly, but I, you know, I've, I've this is the story I've heard is that they were creating fake accounts, pushing systems, getting results back, creating new fake accounts, pushing, getting results back, and that's how they got you know five percent better results than anyone else. But this was a huge scandal because you know you're not supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to only look at your test set once, tune somewhere else, you know, find your own test set. We don't care. It's just that you know be aware that this has real consequences. That's yeah, that's the moral of the story. <laughs> So um, now I describe, uh, because I assume that you're familiar with the way that we, de uh, we declare a learning model in LB Java. Now we are going to uh, describe the two lines here that are related to parameter tuning. So do we have a pointer? No? No? OK. So in this uh, line, um, um, you have the, maybe I go over it. So we have the spam classifier. Uh, which, which applies on a document in the first line. And then I say, OK, I want to learn the spam label. And then I want to use word features and biogram features. And my data actually is stored in the folder data slash train. Now I'm s r writing the algorithm name. So I say I want to use uh, sparse average perceptron. Uh, what that does, for the moment, we don't know. And also, what are these parameters? Also, you don't know. But hopefully, when you learn about the details of the learning algorithms, you will learn more about uh, which, uh, every technique, what kind of parameters it has. Uh, I can just briefly describe for this uh, specific case of average perceptron that uh, the, the example makes sense for you. Uh, for example, uh, average perceptron is really using simple, assume that you can use really simple gradient descent. And then you want to find the minimum of a function, right? Or a maximum of the function, depending how you want to optimize. And then uh, when you want to move uh, in the optimization round, every time you want to actually define the, the step that you take, right? The, over this curve of um, function that you want to find the optimum of it. 
And then you say, okay, I'm going to jump uh, every time when I want to tune the parameters. I want to jump, for example, with the coefficient of one, uh, 0 0.1. This is the parameter that is called learning rate here. Um, so it's a simple gradient descent algorithm and the way that you tune the parameter when you do it like uh, numerically and then you want to tune the step here. And uh, the thickness also is another parameter that says, okay, when I want uh, to, for example, when I see a positive example, then influence of the positive should be this much. And this is a threshold that I am comparing to it. The thickness will be 3.5. And this is the way that you adjust the weight for a specific uh, type of the example. And uh, whether my update should be exact, uh, sim uh, like, um, now you don't know the um, <laughs> model, I, I'm assuming the formula, and I want to describe it, but uh, it is hard, it seems. Uh, so by, uh, anyway, you want to say, OK, how much the errors that I make for a positive example influence the tuning the parameters, and how much, for example, the errors that I make on the negatives will affect my uh, tuning my parameters. So here I, we define one thickness. We can, we can even have positive thickness and negative thickness. And then we point it 3.5. Maybe when we start uh, running this algorithm, we don't have any idea that which number will work here. But here it's, it's a default that is set here as uh, 0.1 and uh, 3.5. And then LB Java gives you the possibility to give a range of values here. And then the, machine, uh, the machinery behind it will try all of this automatically for you and find the best choice. So for example, here the learning point uh, that we want to try is just you give uh, a set of numbers, try 0.1, try 1, try 1.5. For the thickness also, we also have the other syntax to give a range of data. I say, OK, among, uh, in between 1 and uh, 3.5, just take the step of point, uh, 0 0.5 and uh, try the thickness uh, with these values. And then we say, OK, now we are going to do, for example, cross-validation, random. I describe what is this. We just say, try all these parameters in this testing setting, and then uh, tell us which is the best. And then after all, in the end of this line, test from, you will uh, test the finally chosen model with the best parameters on your test data and report the accuracy of your model. Yeah. Pardon? Yes. I think it is greedy search, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so just to describe the CVAL, I talked about the development set before, but uh, sometimes your data is very limited, and then you don't want to set aside a part of it that you could use as training, just set it aside as development set. Uh, that's why you try, you want to use the training for the, uh, actually the it training itself for uh, tuning the parameters. Uh, in this case, uh, people do cross-validation. Cross-validation means split your data like 10%, the training 10% and 90%, and then uh, try your model, uh, use uh, each uh, different, for example, you have your data split into 10 parts, and then you use uh, each part at, the t at, the s at one time uh, to train and test. So you will uh, train and test in all these 10 parts, and then make an average over these 10 parts to see what is the performance of your model on the training. In this case, also, it is a valid setting, because when you train on some part, you test on the other parts, and also you don't uh, use your test. So still, it is a valid setting for uh, tuning the parameters, but it's a different setting than having the development set. So here, we, uh, in this example, we use that. So this is the actual LB Java program that you write. We set the learning rate, thickness, and said, OK, now try this uh, greedily, this, all these parameters in cross-validation, and then test from the test data. So the, the default is the accuracy here. But you can choose the metric, I think. So you, you have another parameter to say what, which metric you use. You have to write a bit of custom Java code for that. But yeah. LB Java allows you to do that as well. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, so do you have any questions on this script? Is it understandable? Yes. So the hope is that you learn how to uh, how you can uh, do higher level programming for machine learning. And also, it's uh, I also hope that you you see that now, for example, we have established a lot of learning algorithms up until now, right? People have worked a lot on this, and now we get uh, more and more uh, like real world complex applications. And then now we are going to design those applications using these building blocks. So, um, I mean, writing an algorithm is not, I think, is not more challenging than designing a good model. So you have the same challenges for designing a good model for a complex task as much as designing a good algorithm. But maybe we are more established for that level of learning algorithms. And now we are going to move to another step. Now these learning models are our basic building blocks. Let's try to do more complex applications by using these. So this is actually a next generation of the research uh, that we think that should be followed more seriously. We are not going to do just simple classification setting. We are working with the data which is correlated. You have a lot of learning components. They receive their data from heterogeneous resources. And OK, you can do with naive Bayesian until maybe for this task until 70%. Whatever you do, you cannot learn more than this for this data. But what you can do is that you correlate other things, you add knowledge to it and do it at the high level to have your own application working. So that is the idea. So yeah, this is the next, uh, the next advanced component that I wanted to mention for LB Java, combining classifiers. So the learning models are our primitives. This is a new generation of, generation of programming languages that give you to work with the data at this high level. So your learning models are black boxes. And then you want to combine them to do complex applications. So for this, uh, combining means like, OK, I have this high level language. I can write if. I can write for loops, uh, make decisions. Procedural use learning as like a normal function when I call like for example, a function which, is, which does some of this array. Now I want to say this function is a learner. Learn from this array. And now uh, if the, the outcome of learner is this, then do that. So this is really a learning-based program that I'm going to write. But also, this is just the procedural normal things that now we do using these primitives. But the other thing is that this, this is a more uh, important uh, aspect of learning-based programming, is that it gives us to make global decisions based on these uh, building block functions. And I need to describe this, of course. Uh, we call it like constraining classifier choices to be related to each other. I'm going to describe this concept via a new application example. OK? So now I'm discussing a more complex application that hopefully I convince you that we really need to proceed and not sticking just with working, tuning, and customizing algorithms. But we really need to think at a higher level and designing models for real world applications and uh, using this new generation of languages. So look at this task. The task still it seems simple. It is something that you are probably familiar with it. We have this sentence. Um, Obama studied at um, Occidental, is that right? Occidental College in Los Angeles. And uh, now we are going to, instead of discussing this sentence as positive, negative, like the previous spam example, Twitter example, we're going to do more fine-grained structured decisions for this sentence. What is a person in this sentence, Obama? Uh, what is the place that Obama studied? It is an organization here. And where is the location? It's Los Angeles. Right? Now we actually spot this part of the sentence, and uh, we assign a label to them classify them. And then we have more complex things to do, relations. So where Obama studied. So we connect these two, and we label it as like studied at. This is a relation, right? This task is a standard natural language processing task. 
is called entity mention relation extraction. And in this task, we have a number of a predefined set of uh, labels, like person, location, organization, um, um, else, something else, and then relations like lives in, works for, born in, studied at, and a number of predefined relations. How this task is useful? So ask Google, where did Obama study? Just put this question in Google, and then you see that it brings the college that he studied, right? And actually what Google, Google does is that Google has a, a structure called a knowledge graph. And it, in this knowledge graph, each node actually is populated with the information that you get from this kind of textual data. I mean, we don't have really a structured database for the location of everything, where everybody born, uh, where they studied. We don't have really a database like that, that we can just say the name and the keyword and then retrieve it. Uh, it is web, and it's all unstructured data. It's all this textual data. And that's why Google actually, what Google does is that to go from this textual data, process it, and extract this information, put them in the databases. And later, easily, or databases, or some structure that is called knowledge graph here, not really exactly a database. And then you can retrieve this data easily in the future. So what Google does actually is that, look at this um, paragraph. This is the biography of, uh, biography of Obama. So as a child, he did that, and then he studied in there. And then, actually, he extracts this information from text, put it in that structure, then it can retrieve it later for you. So this is the motivation of such a task. So here, Google is doing entity relation extraction, actually. So let's, again, see our example. This was the task, right? We had this text. Uh, we wanted to uh, classify entities and then classify the relationships. Now we're going to show the LB Java code that we write for this. So we have three classifiers, simply, as you saw, like for a spam classifier. I have a person classifier. I have a location classifier. I can just chunk my text based on these spaces or whatever, assume that you have some tool that gives you chunks of text. And then you, you write a classifier. We call it phrase here. It gives you the phrases. And then you want to uh, write a phrase classifier here that says person, not person. Right? I ha use person label. It uses features. I have uh, some input file. And I use a sparse perceptron to train this. I have another classifier, which is called location classifier. These are just binary classifiers. And then I have another simple classifier, which works on the more complex object. Here, I had like phrases, but here I have uh, pairs of phrases. So I give it a pair and say if this relation born in holds or not. Again, simple classifier, but working on a more complex object. Now, actually, I should um, uh, tell you that pay attention that if we do independently, we will have problems using these three classifiers. Look at this. Another example. Doll's wife, Elizabeth, is a native of NC, right? We have three entities, and we want to find out what are these entities and what kind of relationship holds between these entities. Actually, I said that the classifiers are black boxes, but for a second, assume that they are not a, just uh, opening the, this black box. They are not really just um, saying discrete decisions like one zero. But actually, most of these classifiers depends on the on the method that you use. But most of these classifiers assign some score, some probability, a number, whatever you call it, that uh, say uh, which is the best answer. If if positive positive being positive gets a higher score or negative gets a higher score. And based on that, they give you a 0 or 1. So these classifiers come with some scores assigned. So now we use these three classifiers that we define. Assume that we classify doll, and it says it is person confident or probability score, whatever you call it, is 85% for person. That's why the classifier will tell us this is a person classifier. And then we classify Elizabeth. Also, it says. 60% person is the highest, and then this is a person. And here we say location. So uh, the location, no, 
it, again, person actually. NC is a person because person is 50% uh, and the other is 45 and uh, only 5% for other. Now, this is really, okay, this is really uh, difficult because if you want to, uh, yeah, let's do it with the relations also. So the first uh, born in, uh, the classifier for the relation tells us the first relation should be born in. It gives a score high to born in. And the second uh, classifier for the relation, the R23, says this relation should be born in. So both of the relation classifiers say this is born in. But this is really inconsistent. I mean, we have three person and the born in relationship between these two, right? So now we are going to uh, give more knowledge to our model and say you should give our, us a decision which best fits the, the uh, all classifiers. And actually, it is consistent with the, uh, our background knowledge about the problem. We know that a person cannot born in another person. Uh, so. <laughs> As I mentioned, if we look at this uh, independently, we say person, person, and then relation born in. But if we can change, we, uh, we can make a new, uh, a, a slightly change our decisions uh, to get also the best um, sum of the scores, uh, but be consistent with this uh, constraint. And that is like when we actually just change to location. Uh, location is still good, it's 45 person, and then we have person and location and born in, now it is consistent. So one of the classifiers changed his mind to be consistent with the constraint that we had on this output. Also for the other thing, we have person, person and born in, but here actually, uh, for example, it is uh, if we change to dispose of, then we will be okay because still it is the best um, some of the score that we get for this tree, and which is consistent with our constraint, that a person can be exposed of another person. We can pick irrelevant, but then irrelevant is not the best score. It is like only 5%. So uh, exposed of is the best answer that is consistent with our uh, knowledge about the problem. So this is the whole um, thing that uh, I wanted to mention, and then, uh, yeah, this is, you see that uh, independent decision over classifiers doesn't work always, and uh, maybe we should look at the cons global, con what we call it global constraint, and then relate the decisions that these classifiers make together. Just to give you an idea that how easily we can write such a constraint in LB Java, you can just say, okay, I have a constraint which is called born in, and I write born in classifier should be true, if person classifier, if the, sorry, if burning classifier is true, then person classifier and location classifier, both of them should be true. So this relationship holds between a person and location. So you see that this is really a first order logic expression, right? It's really a logical expression. You write it as you, but this is used in a complex way. I'm not going to describe integer linear programming, but I just want to point you to that, that uh, yeah, this is, sorry, um, this is the description, like the, a born relation can only exist between a person and location. But then this is solved, actually it's generating like integer linear program that has an objective and some constraints. And then we say, okay, uh, this is two lines of code. You, if you are interested, you can learn the syntax later by looking at the manual. I just want to say you write this in really in two lines of code. If you have experience with MATLAB and defining like integer linear programs and uh, trying to, uh, to set all the input matrix, constraint matrix, you will see that how easy is that, that you write your knowledge and generates the same thing for you. And then now I have my constraint classifier, which is a more intelligent classifier that not only uses my data, but also uses this rule when uh, it wants to make a decision. So this is a global relation classifier, which uses the born in classifier, but it uses the global ER uh, constraint for making inference. So yeah, that was all about the um, advanced components of learning based Java. I think the next uh, step of this, um, so our goal was that to just um, 
motivate you to put hands on learning this language, not only for learning this language, but to think a bit ahead of the uh, future research directions of the machine learning and the way that we want to uh, proceed in this area. Uh, so if you are, um, we, we are successful to motivate you to do this, and now we are going to uh, go back to the simple um, example setting, like the simple classification setting. And uh, we want you really to try with us, uh, start writing a simple classifier. This is another interesting application, like uh, the movies. Uh, this is just simple as uh, before, like you have uh, these codes from movies, and you know these codes are labeled with, this is from the grand, um, what was Godfather, right? The Godfather, this was from uh, this movie, and then we try to learn when we, you, you write a code, uh, it immediately tells you uh, from which movie uh, this is. And uh, then I think the, this, uh, this example has a simple structure. I hope you are patient enough to solve your technical problems and um, try this task with us now. Thank you. So you should all have a zip file hopefully working this time, looking at you, Adam, <laughs> uh, in the, in the uh, course notes, yes? So yes, I want you to either pair up in groups, if possible, if you don't have a laptop with you, or individually if you're, you're feeling adventurous, and try and solve these problems together. So download the zip file, but a bit quieter if possible. Our uh, TAs, our TA right now is there for you, so raise your hand if you have any problems. There's one problem right there, immediately. Okay, and I'm going to walk you through uh, a, um, the, same, the same moves that you're supposed to be doing um, here in the big screen. This is exactly the same structure as the one you've seen before, so we have a bunch of training data, we have a simple classifier, we have readers, and we have an object, right? The reason I wanted to do this task is because of how ridiculously easy it is to do. I literally went to Wikiquote, which you should try, it's really awesome, and then I started entering movie names, and then it gives you like the most memorable, memorable quotes from the movies, right? So what I did was literally just copy the text from uh, three movies I think I chose from my training. I copied the entire text I could find on Wikiquotes, and I say, you know, fine, I know that every line is a quote. Here, you know, we have this one saying the quote, you know, only you could be so bold. Oh, no, this is pretty late. Only you can be so um, So, <laughs> so um, it, is, it is literally just going, finding the data, defining your conceptual structure of it. So it's like, I know a quote is a single line, and I know I want to read it as such. And then I thought, OK, what would be an application of this? It's like we can make up quotes, right? So you can start typing in whatever you want and see which one movie would match closest to the thing you type. So maybe if you type, you know, ooh, the force is smelling like bacon, maybe it's Star Wars. But if you say, I want to make you an offer that you can't, you know, get grill, then maybe it's Godfather, you know. So you can test and see if you can break the classifier, if you, know, if you can get it to, to spit out a wrong decision, or a fun one. Um, the classifier is already pre-made for you at this time, so you, there's no filling in. But if you want to, if you want to be adventurous, you can try coming up with new features. You can try coming up with better, cleverer features that will help your classifier be less dumb, I guess, uh, at the end. Uh, the, the other thing that I've done for you is uh, a script that has all the compilation commands that I, I was running manually last time. So the only thing you need to do uh, for those of you who have Linux machines and Mac machines, sorry Windows users, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can try and find online help of how to make this into a bat, but uh, yeah, sorry, I apologize. Maybe our assistants will help you. Um, so if you do that and run the compilation script, what it should do is it should train a classifier based on these three movies and get you 
What does it mean to get you 100% of the test data? Let me, let me show you what the test data is. So the test data I just got for exactly from the same movies. I made sure that those lines are not part of the training data, of course, because that would be cheating. Um, but I just got two or three examples per movie and say, okay, this is my test. Can you predict that it comes from the right movie? And it can, right? It's 100% correct. But does that mean that if I enter any quote from any of these three movies, okay, sorry, I should say GOT, you probably know what it is. Game of Thrones, yes. Game of Thrones season one, favorite. Um, not so, not a movie, but you know. Um, so can it tell us really, is, the, is this 100% accurate? Is it like actually that good? So if I say anything that has the word force in it or like, you know, Don Corleone or something, will it always find uh, the answer? And, you know, we can try it. Like, we can say, use the force. And it's like, oh, yeah, Star Wars 4. Yeah, excellent, awesome. Okay. But what if I say, use the force? Aha. You see what happened? Can you guess what happened? Yes. Capital force is the only force that exists in Star Wars. <laughs> We can't have any other type of force, guys. This is not respectful to the force. So, <laughs> for all of you, yeah. uh, it's a religion, you know, it's an official religion. So, um, so, so it, it can still be full. So this 100% this, this is actually misleading, right? And in fact, there is a very easy way for you to make it fail even more spectacularly. Try adding another data set, another data point, which is Star Wars 5 or six, or seven, right? Or one, or two, and three. What would you think it will happen to this score? And then I will do it live. Any suggestions what will happen? Take us. So if I, if, I, if I enter the same line, use the force, which one will be? Four or five? No? Okay, well that's, that's the whole point. It will be random. It will be like, Sure, it matches either one. And you will see that the test set will start failing. It will give me, you know, 75% accuracy, 60% accuracy, because it won't be easy to tell, because they're so close together, right? So this is part of the trick. It's like you need to know what your data looks like, what your input is going to look like, what, what your test is going to look like, okay? And then you should try and break it. So like, oh, yeah, of course, that's what Don Corleone says, right, in The Godfather. Uh, <laughs> But this is this is what you know. Um, I think I tried this, but I don't know if it works. Yeah. See, it doesn't even say that, right? And the reason for this is that if you see my classifier, it's as simple as we can get. It's a naive base, so it's a frequency-based classifier. So it basically is like uh, the reason for this. In fact, if you see the data set, is like Godfather has the most data. It has the most quotes. So basically, it's overfitting. It's like, ah, anything that I don't really know, it's probably the Godfather, <laughs> right? <laughs> so unless you hit the exact code that you found in uh, Game of Thrones, it will fail. And this is why I'm saying this, this example, this uh, test accuracy is misleading, because here it says we predict two out of two lines from Game of Thrones, but it's because they were so closely connected to the stuff that we actually see in the movies. Uh, sorry, in the, in the, in the quotes. Okay, the other thing, uh, as you saw the, the force force example, right? The other thing that you need to know is when we're dealing with data, we have to know the nature of the data, right? We have to know that this particular data set is not pre-processed. So it's not like lowercase, it's not tokenized, which means separating punctuation symbols. You know, if, if I say use the force with a dot at the end, whoops, uh, uh. <laughs> exactly, you see? It's, it's so easy to get all of these things and sort of ignore them as part of your training and testing. It should be that you have a whole idea uh, that surrounds the data set, the classifiers, and the, and, and the testing of your corpus. Okay, uh, we do have, okay, we do have a bit more time. So I do want to try the uh, Star Wars example. Yeah, if you do, please keep raising your hands. People will run to you for assistance. I assume everyone is doing amazingly. Like, they all have their classifiers running. It's, it's perfect. In my mind, it's, like, amazing. 
Um, okay, so let's see. There's a dark time for the rebellion. Yes. Uh, I apologize, my scrolling is not fast enough. We're getting there. Slowly but surely. Boy, is our last hope, indeed. No! Okay, so, look how easy it is, right? So I say, okay, this here is a new training uh, example. Oops. This. Uh, data, oops, data, train. Right? I paste the text, save it. And now we need a test for this. So what I will do is I will take a couple of lines from this. Let's say, you know, this one. And I will create a new one. That I want. And maybe this one. Again, you see, I'm removing it from the train set because, again, that would be cheating. Uh, and then, okay. So, there's a great disturbance. In the, oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'll keep doing the funny voices until you <laughs> stop me. Um, okay, we go to remote space. All right. So, let's see what happens, right? Hopefully, I haven't screwed this up. There you go. You see? So, uh, between Star Wars 4 and Star Wars 5, we have this mismatch, right? So uh, P is the prediction and L is the, uh, the correct label data. So it made three predictions for Star Wars 4, whereas it was two. Um, and we have three actual examples from Star Wars 5, but it only got two out of those. So it misclassified one for the other, right? So if I say the force is strong, not string, close. <laughs> there you are, five. But this this could have been at random, right? So this this either four or five could have been a, a viable candidate here. So this is what I want you to do if if you were willing to spend more time here. Find movies that will confuse this classifier. I I recently found that the Lion King and the Godfather are very similar. <laughs> Honest, this, these are honest examples, like I, this, I, um, this is all empirical data that I'm giving you. Um, I also found that if you do spend the time to make sure that you have your characters in, so if you, if you use your characters as features, so if I say, you know, oh, uh, well, let's, let's see. Emperor. What? <laughs> oh, I missed something. Yes. Emperor. How many R's is in an emperor? One. Okay. Nope. Well, anyway, it shows you what I know, right? So, <laughs> so, find a better classifier. Find better features. Find better data. Fine-tune your parameters. Do, do the tuning that you saw. All of these things are open to make this into a better classifier. And play, like have fun, right? See, see what comes out. Uh, again, as always, questions. Okay? The last thing I want to show you before I let you go is this LB Java and the, the code that I wrote is itself just Java, right? And you know what the cool thing about Java is? It can run on Android. So what I did this morning was, yep, you guessed it, we have an Android app. Yes, exactly. And what it does, <laughs> exactly. N that will be in the uh, Play Store, like, you know, this, this afternoon. You know, I will make billions. Like, it will be charged, I don't know, $10? Is that, is that a fair price? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but oh, no, 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 like, this is, this is the real part, right? I just wanted to show you. It is as simple as getting a Java thing to work and getting a text in, giving it to the classifier, and getting a response back. It's like, if you see the code, is it, as, it is as simple as it gets. It's like, here's my input. Here's my output, here's the text, do a discrete classification. That's it. That's the only thing this button does, right? There's a question. Yes? What? 
There was a question? Assistance? Okay, yeah. I think with, uh, we can't top up the, um, the Android app. I think we should leave it there. <laughs> so keep trying. Uh, the, the Android app is not part of the, uh, the handouts, but you know, if, you, if you're interested, let me know. Uh, you should be able to Google me or not, <laughs> if you can spell my name correctly. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, but if not, yeah, please come, um, get in touch with the TAs. Uh, any problems that you might have had with any of these apps uh, or demos that I gave you, or any other questions other than that, yeah, we can take some questions now, or uh, yeah, you can go your way. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, homework. Homework is up. Yes, is up on the website. September fifteenth. Yes.